Father, we come before you today, God. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, we thank you that it doesn't return void, but it accomplishes what it's sent forth to accomplish in our lives, God. And we just thank you for it and ask that we'd forever be changed, that we'd have some aha moments. I never saw that before moments, God, and uh, speak to our lives in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 So, Candy, we're going to jump ahead and start at John chapter 4 uh, in our scripture notes. We're going to miss some of the beginning. So what I want to talk to you about today is um, uh, the, woman, the woman at the well. Many of you are familiar with the passage in, in, in John chapter 4. It was really upon my heart to share this with you guys um, this morning. And so, John chapter 4, uh, verse 1, we're going to actually start in verse 4, okay? It says, Jesus knew that the Pharisees had, he had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself did not baptize them, his disciples baptized them, Okay? So he had, how many know he had a successful ministry? Many, many, many people went to John to be baptized and to repent. And so now Jesus' ministry is, begin, is becoming bigger than John's. God's beginning to do something amazing. There's this transition that's happening. So the Bible says he left Judah and returned to Galilee. And he had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sakar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired from the long walk. He sat wearily beside the well at noontime. I want you to note this. He's sitting at the well at noontime. Say noontime. noontime. Okay, this is significant. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. So he was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. So there's some, some things I want you to note here. Number one, it's afternoon, okay? This woman comes to the well in the afternoon. Now, I don't know about you if you've ever been to Israel. Okay, I haven't been there, but I, I know this to be a fact. It's hot during the day. And so it was a custom for women to go to the well late in the evening or early in the morning but never midday. And I think the reason she went midday was because she was the village outcast. She was the person um, who didn't really go uh, with the other women because she had some baggage. Say baggage. baggage. How many know that people can be pretty mean sometimes? Yes. So she had some baggage, and so she was kind of like the outcast, okay? And she comes to Jacob's well. Now, you need to understand this. In, in those days, the well actually is a symbol of community. In ancient times, the well was both symbolically and oftentimes literally the loca was located at the center of the community. And from the well, the community drew water, and the basic, uh, which is the basic su uh, sustenance for life. So here we have a well would be found or dug, and then all of a sudden a community would evolve around that well. It's kind of like Tim Hortons today, right? So you build a Tim Hortons, next thing you know, you have a town there in five years. And it's kind of the similar type of thing, right? And so, so here she is. Um, you know, this is the social networking place of the day. This is the, face, the Facebook, the Instagram. You know, this is the ChristianMingle.com of the day, okay? This is where people came to connect with one another was at the well. All right, and she was she was she was a social outcast, so she couldn't come with the other ladies. She showed up when nobody else was there. Okay, and so it was, the the well was actually known as kind of like a fishing ground. Men would go to the well to see if they could find a spouse, because that was a social place, and they would come. And today, you know, men go to Bible college. We call it bridal college, because they're look they're going to Bible college and they're saying, "Who am I going to hook up with here and do ministry with?" Right, and it's just kind of the thing that happens. Okay, um, so, so the women would come in the evening or the morning for, for water uh, and to have so, social time, okay? Now what I want to do is I want to go back to Genesis chapter 24. I'm going back in time now. We're going way, way back where Abraham's around. And Abraham has a son, Isaac. How many know he had a son, Isaac? So Abraham says, I've got to find a wife for my son, so I'm going to get my servant to go down and look for a wife for my son. So this is what he's doing. So Abraham's servant is looking to find a wife for uh, Isaac. So the, he, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 24, verse 11. It says, he made the camels kneel beside a well just outside the city. It was evening, and the women were coming out to draw water. Remember, they came in the evening. It's not too hot. 
And the Lord God, and so, O oh Lord, God my, of my master Abraham, he prayed. So the servant is talking to God. Please give me success today and show unfailing love to my master Abraham. See, I am standing here beside this spring, and the young women of the town are coming out to draw water. This is my request, Father. I, I, I will ask one of them, would you please give me a drink from your jug? Would you give me a drink from your jug? If she says, yes, have a drink, uh, and I'll also water your camels for you while you're here, uh, let her be the one that you have selected as Isaac's wife. So he puts his fleece out. How many have ever done that? You know, Lord, you know, if you really, really want me to go to, to Alaska to preach a gospel, have my goldfish jump out of the bowl into my cereal bowl, and then I will know that you have called me, right? So we do that sometimes, and this is, this is what he's doing. So... Uh, so this is how I'm going to know. So first of all, if you read on in the story, which you can do on your own with your Bible plan, we see something that happens as this woman, Rebecca, comes. And she comes, and she's the one that offers. She comes, and, she, uh, and she's asked by the servant, could you give me a drink? And she says, yeah, sure. You want me to feed? you want me to give water to your camels as well? So he's like, she's the one. So he's excited. The thing with Rebecca, though, is Rebecca is, she's a virgin which means she's pure, she's innocent, she's never had anybody, and she comes from this great lineage, and she's, she's, she's a somebody. Say, she's a somebody. And we see, we see this picture here that Isaac finds his wife at givemewater.com, right? Right here at the well, right? I can't imagine. It's so amazing today. I talk to people, where did you meet your spouse? Yeah, I met her on this website or, you know, plenty of fish or whatever. I'm like, really? Like... It's a, it was a different day. So he, 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 find, so he finds her there, all right? And then Isaac's son, Jacob, goes to the same website, or the same well, sorry. Right? So, so Isaac finds Rebecca, and then he goes, you know, hey, it worked. I'm going to send, I'm going to send, I'm going to go to the well. I'm going to go to this social networking place where all the girls hang out. I'm going to pick out a wife for myself. So he's got this whole thing planned. So now we're going to move ahead you know, 40 years or something, to Genesis chapter 29, verse 7 to 11. So Jacob said, look, it's still broad daylight, too early to round up all the animals. Why don't you water the sheep and goats so they can get back to the pasture, okay? Uh, we can't water the animals until all the flocks have arrived, they replied. Then the shepherds moved the stone from the mouth of the well. And we watered all the sheep and the goats. So he's having this conversation. And look what happens in verse 9. Jacob was still talking with them when Rachel arrived with her father's flock, for she was a shepherd. And because Rachel was his cousin, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and because the sheep and the goats belonged to his uncle Laban, Jacob went over to the well and he moved the stone from the mouth of the well. He's like, hey, look how strong I am. I'm moving the stone. Are you impressed? And she turns at him and she's like, oh. You are the guy. And then Jacob <laughs> kissed Rachel, and he wept. Like Shakespeare, oh, you are so... You know, it was just an emotional moment. But what happens here, we have two stories here of, of, you know, our patriarchs meeting their spouses at the well. They met him at the well. So this is significant. I love the Bible because now Jesus is meeting someone at the well. This is significant, okay? So let's go back to our story. So we're going to go back to verse 7 now. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. There's some things to note here, okay? She's the outcast. She's not a virgin. She's got some baggage. She's got some some stuff that, it, that is lingering in her past, okay? Um, but how many know Jesus is looking for a bride? Not in the carnal or the natural way. He wasn't looking for a wife, but he was looking for a people who he could have a relationship with. And he didn't consider the fact that she had a mess and she had baggage. He was there because an appointment that day to touch someone's life. Isaiah 54 verse 5 says, For your husband is your maker whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. See, God doesn't just want you to be his servant. God doesn't just want you to be a son and daughter. This book starts with God walking 
in friendship with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, and it ends at a wedding feast where God is connecting us with his son, Jesus Christ. So we are in intimate relationship where there's this love relationship that God wants us to have with him. That is powerful. How many say that's powerful? And this is what what God is doing. And so he's looking for a bride. And then then verse 9, Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink of me? I'm a Samaritan woman. Okay? And, and, and so he's saying, first of all, you're, you're a Jew and you're asking me, a Samaritan, for a drink. Jews didn't talk to Samaritans. You say Jesus was breaking the religious rules. Just say it so you remember. Jesus was breaking the religious rules. He was like, I, I'm going to talk to you because God loves you. And so, so here he is. I said, why are you talking to me? I, I'm a Samaritan. I'm, you know, you guys consider us the half-breed nation. You, what do you, why would you even talk to me? And not only that, I'm a, I'm a woman. Men, men don't approach women unless they're coming to, you know, to propose or to whatever. Why are you talking to me, okay? And Jesus answered and said to her, okay, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would give you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then are you going to get that living water? See, she thought that he was talking about something natural, right? It was like just a little bit before in, in, uh, in uh, John chapter 3, 14 or something up in there, uh, he meets Nicodemus, and Nicodemus, is say, he says, Hey, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, Man, how do, I, how do I go back in my mom and come out again? Like, he just didn't get it. And he's saying, No, no, I'm talking about spiritually. You have to be born again spiritually. And the same thing he's saying to this woman, you need a drink. You need, a, you need some nourishment for your spirit. Okay? And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where are you going to get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water shall give unto him, okay, a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And Jesus was talking about that thirst, okay, in a person's spirit for God. And you will never satisfy, and this is something we have to always remember, you will never be satisfied by trying to quench your spiritual thirst with physical experiences. You'll never be satisfied trying to quench a spiritual thirst with physical experiences. And this is what happens is that we all have wells. We all have places where we go and we draw from that and we think we're going to find some, 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 some kind of quenching of this spiritual thirst. And we go to those wells and we try to draw from them, right? Uh, but they'll never bring satisfaction. Do you know, I remember when I was 18, I had a car, which I'll talk about in a minute. But I didn't, I didn't really, my car was okay. But I wanted, my, my neighbor, I came up one day, my neighbor had this brand new Z24. And he said, you know, hey, listen. And I was used to driving like cars that didn't, you know, didn't drive very, very, very nice. So he goes, hey, you want to come with me to the store? I said, sure. He said, you want to drive? I said, absolutely. So he gave me the keys. It's a five-speed. I'm going to the store, and he goes, yeah, let it, let it go. So I, I'm just going through the gears, and I'm saying, I'm in love with this car. Like, I really, if I had this car, I would be so happy. I mean, I would be fulfilled. And all the girls would, like, ch- say, hey, look at this guy. He's cool. He has a car, right? This, I'm letting you into my thoughts. So, you know, I'm going to be like a chick magnet, and this is going to be great, and I have a nice car, and everybody else is going to show up in their Chevettes, and I'm going to have a nice, and I'm thinking like this. Just nobody thought like that before. This is what I'm thinking like. <laughs> the girls will notice me, right? And so um, what happened was, okay, I bought this car. So I went to work. I worked for six or eight months. And my father helped me purchase a car. He locked it in the garage till I paid him back. I remember that. And um, <laughs> finally, when I paid him back, he gave me the, the key to the garage, and I took my car out. It was awesome. But by that time, my neighbor now had bought uh, a, a Cura Integra 
our, our class, which is really sporty, he said, no, this is a real nice car. And I'm like, now I'm looking at this car. My car is not, not very special anymore, right? Uh, but but this, this is what I'm saying. I was realizing, hey, this didn't fulfill me like I thought it would. All right? Now, now the thing was, I was kind of like the prodigal son. Before I got my Z24, uh, I said to my, my father, I said, I'm going to be a machinist. I just need my high school. I don't need college. I don't need all that. I'm just going to go. So give me my inheritance that comes to me now. <laughs> give me all the money you saved for college. And my dad said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll buy you a car. Yes, I'm going to get a car. So I think he was thinking the opposite. I said, I want a, a car that's going to attract the girls. And he said, I'm going to get him a car that will de- push the girls away. So, <laughs> so I come home. And he goes, son, here's your new car. And it's a Pontiac 6000 full-size station wagon. I'm like, Dad, this is not cool. And so we would go, you know, and it was, and my friends would make fun of me and say, like, yeah, here comes Travis in a station wagon, right? And so I really wanted the Z24. I was like, man. And, and my friends would tease me until Friday night came because back in those days, we'd go to the drive-ins. You guys remember the drive-in theaters? And I would back up and I'd put my mattress there and I'd kick up the top and I'd lay back and everyone would be sitting in their little sports cars. And I'd have, you know, just have a little party in the back of my car. So... I regress. I'm going to go away from this now. Okay. <laughs> so I got my Z24. All's good. Life is awesome. And then uh, uh, my friend's um, girlfriend has a sister, and she likes me, and she goes out with me for like a week, and like totally is not showing interest. I can't figure out why. And then she dumps me, and her sister tells me, yeah, she was only going out with you for your car. And I'm like, well, that sucks. So I went and bought a Chevette <laughs> for 150 bucks because I said, you know, I want to make sure... I meet a girl that she likes me for who I am, not my car. And I didn't have a girlfriend for a long time. Let's forget that. Okay, move on. Um, but we all have wells. We all have things that we go to and we want to draw. We think that we're going to, with a physical experience, we're going we're to fill this longing in us, this thirst in us for God, this thirst to be reconnected with God. And so we go to these wells and it might be to achieve success. It might be to have status in your life. Whatever that well is, it might be fame. It might be the applause of men. It might be addictions that you keep going to. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe, maybe it's overeating. Maybe it's substance abuse. Whatever it is, you go and you're going to that well every day with your bucket. And guess who's sitting at your well? Jesus. Jesus. He's sitting at that well and says, listen, this is what you're trying to get here out of this well. I can give you life. I can give you water that will, you'll never thirst again. You're going to be filled up inside if you'll only take and come into relationship with me. So the woman said in verse 15, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst. I don't want to come here to have to draw water. And so here's really cool. Jesus said to her, Hey, go and call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And here's what Jesus said to her. You've said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you truly spoke. And so here's the thing, like, okay, think about the mercy of Jesus. Okay? Not one divorce, not two divorces, not three, not four, not five. And now she's given up on marriage and she's living with somebody. Now let me ask you this question. Does she have baggage? She's got baggage. And so Jesus brings it up. Jesus says, hey, these are the issues. This is your baggage. And then you know what she does? She does what all of us do. She changes the subject. Like, like read it. It's right there. So the woman said to him, hey, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. So Jesus knew her past, so she immediately changes the subject. And she says, hey, by the way, our fathers worshipped on this mountain over here. Let's not talk about my baggage. How many know that we don't want to talk about our baggage? And so, so she said, you know, hey, here, here it is. Uh, our fathers worship on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place that we ought to worship. And Jesus doesn't go back and say, oh, no, hold on. You're changing the subject. I want to talk about your sin. She doesn't do that. Jesus does not do that. Jesus goes, hey, hey, hey let, this is what it's all about. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You're, you worship 
what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Okay? But he says, here's the key, but the hour is coming and now is. So he's saying it's right now for you, woman. This is the time for you. Right now. Look what he says to her. He says, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And he's saying this is what it's about. It's about worship. Worship is intimate relationship with God. And it, this, is, this is the time for you right now to understand that God wants to have an intimate relationship. It's not about worshiping at the mountain. It's not about worshiping at the temple. It's not about all of our religious structures. It's about having a connection with God. Okay, and this is what Jesus is saying. And then the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he's going to tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, I'm he. Jesus is at our wells this morning. And look what happens. At this point, the disciples came and they marveled and they, that he was talking with a woman. Because in those days, uh, you know, I'll tell you something. There was a girl, I remember I was in Kingston, one girl, she went to school, high school, and they had to um, talk about historical figures that changed history. And they had to do a report on that. So she's, she came in and she did, and they didn't want her to do it because it was on Jesus. But her whole thing was on how Jesus did more for equal rights than any other historical figure. Because in his days, he stood up for, for women. And he talked with women. And he loved women. And he gave them authority. And he believed in women. And this, the, I mean, the class was just, and the teacher was like, yeah, that's awesome. I never saw it. And she did this whole thing and showed how in that day, when women were looked at as lower classes, and Jesus came, and he had no problem with a woman weeping at his feet, had no problem with sending out the first evangelist to go and preach the gospel at the tomb and say, go and tell the disciples that I've risen. He had no problem with that. He, he elevated women back to stand beside men. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. All right. And so they're marveling. Why is he talking to a woman? And Jesus is like, because you guys don't get it. <laughs> and so look what happens. And at this point, maybe hopefully you see this scripture different than you've ever, ever seen it. Because it, it opened my eyes. Look what happens. At this point, his disciples came. They marvel. And verse 28, the woman then left her water pot. When you have an encounter with intimacy with God, you'll leave your water pot at the well and you'll leave. You don't have to go back and try to find with natural experiences an infilling of joy. I don't need pornography anymore. I don't need, I don't need to you know, find my in addictions. I don't need this. I don't need that. What I need is Jesus. And when you get touched and enter into that place of worship, you leave your water pot and you go away. Amen. And some of you in this place maybe. You've never left your water pot. You've never accepted the Lord. This, today's a day you can do that. But there's others of us who maybe once in a while we go back and we pick up our water pot and we try to find sustenance in that old way. And Jesus is saying, throw it down. I'm still at your well. And so she left her water pot and she went her way into the city and said to the man, come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And then they went out to the city and came to him. She had such a powerful testimony of an encounter with, with Jesus that, uh, think about this, she, she has, she's, she's been, um, uh, she, she, she's, not, she's not popular, she's, been, she's disliked by the community, she's been unfriended by all her Facebook friends, like she is, and she has no popularity, she, they, she, they look at her, she's a nobody, and she shows up, and something so transformed her, that she's like, come on, you got us, I want you to meet someone who could be the Messiah, and so all of a sudden, everybody follows her, because something has so changed in her life, they can see it physically, and they follow her to see Jesus. I say all that is because she didn't show up and say, hey, guys, let, let me, um, I, I, want, I want you to come and, and, and learn about my faith or come to my church or read the book that I'm reading, uh, the Bible. It, it wasn't that. It was like, I want you to meet somebody who just changed my life. 
And if we as believers would be able to tell people that, listen, you need to meet somebody. His name is Jesus. And, and you know, I can, this is important, but it's more than this. It's your testimony. We overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And when you get around people and you say, listen, Jesus transformed my life and this is my story and this is my testimony to say, hey, man, I want to go. Let's go, and, let's go and meet this Messiah. And so all of these people come. Verse 31, in the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Again, he's speaking metaphorically. Verse 33, therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him a cheeseburger, a poutine, poutine, French, what is that, French Canadian salad? Um, Who brought him food? He's not hungry, but he's talking about spiritual nourishment. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And then he said something. He said, do you not say that there's still four months and then comes the harvest? Basically, in four months from now, we're going to be harvesting our potatoes and our grains and our carrots and like four months to the harvest. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you're right. And Jesus says, behold, I say to you, lift your eyes and look at the fields. For they're already white for harvest. And I believe his disciples looked up and they saw over the hill a town of people coming to meet Jesus. And I believe that when we get to a place where we're returning to Jesus and saying, you are, you're going to be the river that sustains me. I'm going to throw out my watering pot and I'm going to find everything in you. That, and, and, and God begins to touch us at that intimate level. When we go back, not with a doctrine though doctrine's important, but with a revelation of a relationship of a person named Jesus. Amen. People will come to the church. People will come to small group. People will get saved. Amen? Amen. And I have, uh, if we get someone on the keyboard, would be great. And so there's some of you in this room today, um, God's speaking to you. I know he's speaking to me. I'm the preacher and he's talking to me, <laughs> you know. He talks to all of us, and this is what he's saying. You'll never be satisfied by trying to quench your spiritual thirst with, with physical experiences. And there's some in this room who have never left your water pot, have never met Jesus, and never allowed him to become the Lord of your life. Today, I want to encourage you to do that. Let's all stand for a moment. And then there's others of us in this place who, you know, we've come to, come to the Lord and we've, 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 uh, we've drink, we, we drink this living water, but we're tempted sometimes, or maybe sometimes we slip and we pick up the old watering pot. We say, we try to find, we try to find life in that, and we will never find life in that. It's all Jesus. Amen? Mark, did you want to just come and share? Because Mark just approached me before the service and she's, she wanted to share something just really quickly. Um. Um, this morning, um, I was in prayer this morning, and uh, the Lord really, I, I'm always um, trying to do my duty by praying for my family, my father's family. My father was a pastor, and I have some wayward siblings and uh, nieces and nephews, great nieces and nephews, so it takes quite a, a lengthy prayer to get them all covered, but While I was praying, the Lord so impressed me of Hosea 6 and 1. Come and let us return to the Lord. It's time. It's time for all of us. Some of us have been wandering for a long time. And I just felt the brevity in my spirit this morning that the Lord is saying, Come, wherever we are. Some of us are walking with the Lord, but the Lord is drawing us closer, as Pastor said. And the other thing was the song that we sang this morning um, by Brian Dirksen, Holy, Holy, Holy. I was singing that. The Lord brought that to me while I was praying, and I was singing that, Holy, Holy. So we must come because he's holy. And unless we come and grow up in our walk with him, we can't approach the Lord. We can't have that intimacy that the Lord's longing for. And the other thing was that let us pursue, let us know, And let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. That's what we're doing this year, right? We're all reading through the Bible together. We're pursuing him. Let us know him. Who is he? He is the word. He is the word. This isn't just his book or his story. He is the word. So if you want to know him, 
search for him and say, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you. It's time. And then he will come like the rain, like the latter rain and the former rain to the earth. So he, heed that, that word this morning. It's for every one of us, wherever we are before the Lord. Come, come, come. Let us return to the Lord. I mean, if you're in this place, so just every, every head bowed, every eye closed. And if you're in this place and you've never met Jesus and you have never come into relationship with him, I just want you to lift your hands just as a sign. I want to pray with you in this place. I see your hands. I see your hands. Anybody else? Throw your hands. Okay. Let's all pray this prayer together. Say, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you send Jesus to take my place on the cross. I receive him today as my Lord and Savior. And I thank you that you deliver me from the power of darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So what I want to do today, this was, I want to encourage you today to know this, that Jesus is at the well. And whatever you're struggling with, if you're struggling with things, that Jesus will, he, he's the one who's going to fill it. I believe God's been speaking to you. So we're going to have our prayer team up here. We're going to finish with a worship song. And if you just say, hey, I want to just make a, a fresh commitment today, and I just want to have some prayer, and I want to walk out of here free, that I want you to just come to the altars. We'll pray with you. And, uh, and uh, that's... What we're, how we're going to finish today, okay? So, Father, I just pray, Lord, that you speak to our hearts, God. We thank you that you're at our wells, and you've empowered us, and you love us, and you're not looking at our baggage. You're not concerned about our baggage. You want us to look to you and have intimacy with you. So, God, I pray even now, God, that you're speaking to someone in this place. Amen.